Good afternoon and welcome to the Gunsmith Shop. I'm Richard Sullivan, one of the gunsmiths here. Uh, I've been here 17 years and uh, we make these guns today the way they were made. Uh, we use the same types of tools, the same technology, same raw materials that were used in the 18th century. And we do the whole thing, uh, lock, stock, and barrel. That's a literal truth here. Uh, gunsmith in a small American shop had to be able to work all those different raw materials in order to be able to do repair work. And uh, firearms, like most tools and utensils, are significantly cheaper if they're imported. Um, the type of firearm that uh, every farmer needs for predator and pest control is the one that's going to be most routinely imported. It's cheaper for a farmer to come into town and go to the store and buy a gun over the counter than to have it made here. Uh, primary economic need here is to fix a gun made cheaper in England. Um, materials are expensive, labor is cheap, so you repair things until they couldn't be repaired anymore. Uh, this is the real workhorse of 18th century firearms. It's a uh, official name is a fouling piece. Um, today you call this type of firearm a shotgun. Uh, this is the type of gun that is the most versatile. Uh, shot pellets come in a dozen different sizes. Um, and that's because things that like to eat corn come in a dozen different sizes. Uh, Fowler is versatile. Um, this is recognizable as uh, having English influences. Uh, the, the finial on the top of the comb, uh, the finial on the front of the guard, um, a deep round wrist that flows into the buttstock. And it's, uh, it has handling qualities that make it good for uh, bird hunting, so hence the name fowling piece. Uh, the barrel on a fowler is typically, as they would have described it, part squared, part round. Uh, the octagon shape at the breech reinforces the breech. The barrel turns round. As the barrel turns round, it tapers toward the muzzle, making it lighter out front than, uh, than the, the one type of firearm likely to have been made here. Um, a sub type of this gun is a, an Indian trade gun. Um, Daniel Boone referred to it as a cheap trading gun. Um, it uses the smallest amount of raw material. I don't know if you can notice how thin the, the butt piece is. Uh, and in spite of how thin that piece is, it's bent to shape. Uh, held on with nails as opposed to wood screws. Um, but it's decorated um, on that top extension. Uh, the side plate is engraved. The uh, thin trigger guard is only screwed to the surface of the wood. It hasn't been inlet. And some brass parts have been eliminated completely. Um, this doesn't have a tail piece. The ramrod enters the stock with no brass piece um, protecting the wood in that area. Um, and if you study Indian treaties, and uh, one we quote typically in here is a 1767 Indian treaty where the cost of this gun was 16 pounds of dressed deer skin. Uh, the medium of exchange and the standard by which you judge value is in pounds of dressed deer skin. I don't know, we can go to the uh, pouring brass uh, video that we have, but there's a lot more brass in a cast mount where the, where the brass was poured into a mold made of damp sand. Yep, that's yep, gonna yep. use a lot more raw material than thin sheet metal that's only been bent to shape. Uh, so on, our, on the firearms we make here, they're, they're cast brass mounts. The butt piece is cast in a mold yep, made yep, of damp yep, sand. Yep. Uh, the side plate yep. is Stop. cast. Um, oversized in all its proportions, and we can vary distances based on the size of the lock. Um, but this uh, this one also uses the uh, a, a much cheaper type of wood. It's a, it's beech. It's a suitable wood for a gun stock. It's hard and dense. If they described this uh, in a document, they'd say vine painted. Uh, there's a reference to the uh, um, militia. Uh, boys militia going into the magazine and they uh, got armed themselves with blue painted stock trade guns. So sometimes they're painted colors that you wouldn't think typically would be characteristic of a firearm, but it paints a cheaper form of decoration. Um, third category of uh, firearms that's likely to be imported was a horse pistol. Uh, gentlemen and travelers need pistols. Horse pistol refers to it being carried on horseback. Um, so somebody in 
backcountry roads had a way to protect themselves. The pistol buckets or, uh, in, or cones are uh, over the neck of the saddle, and uh, this type of pistol was normally sold in pairs. So match pairs of pistols are uh, a common way to protect yourself when traveling. If you were on a coach, you could carry them in a case. The, the one type of firearm likely to be made here is a rifle. Um, and this rifle is a good example of a, what comes to be called a long rifle. Um, it is recognizable as American. Um, rifle barrels are, are formed in an octagon, uh, or as they said in the period, squared. Uh, rifle barrels are tapered and flared. Their exterior surface tapers to save weight. That is going to put the balance point about where your forward hand goes. Uh, rifles have uh, two sights, a hind sight and a foresight. Uh, and since you're aligning your eye behind those two sights, rifles have a cheek piece. So that's not a characteristic you see on other types of firearms, aligning your eye quickly behind those sights. One of the American characteristics not only is long barrel, but um, this brass box becomes a, a dominant American characteristic. The box is for linen patches and grease that are wrapped around the bullet. Uh, for those of you not familiar with what a rifle is, rifle means that there are spiral grooves in the barrel. Those spiral grooves are there to make the bullet spin, which means you have to load something bigger than the hole. Uh, so it's not practical to hammer down an oversized bullet. Instead, it's more typical to wrap a slightly undersized bullet in a linen patch, making the cloth compress to engage the groove so it'll spin coming out. Uh, this could have been made in a shop that was as small as one man and a helper who had to do it all. Making new parts for an old gun is the same technology as making new parts for a new rifle. Um, and in spite of it being made with the possibility of little or no specialization, it's one of the first American products recognized for its quality in Europe. A British officer during the revolution wrote that never in my life have I seen better rifles or men who shot better than those made in America. Well, rifles in a military context are, are reserved for specialist marksmen. And that's the first 10 companies in the United States Army. Uh, the troops that marched to Boston throughout the summer of 1775 were riflemen from Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, and the Congressional Resolution said expert riflemen. So two of those companies come from Virginia. I don't know if we have any questions yet, but... Yes, Richard, thanks. We, we do. Uh, first, could you tell us about the process of making a barrel? Yeah, and this is what is most surprising to most people because they assume you drill a hole which since 1845 was technologically possible. Uh, in this period, it was not technologically possible to drill a straight hole through a solid bar. So a gun barrel starts as a flat bar of wrought iron and gets heated, hammered, folded, and welded into a seamless tube. So the first thing you make in the barrel is the hole. And the hole is nothing more than a path of least resistance. Uh, reaming bits cannot make their own hole uh, they are following the hole that's there, making that hole larger and smoother. Um, an 18th century consumer, especially as one having a rifle made, would specify barrel length, bore size, uh, weight. The uh, stock would be uh, adjusted critical distances. And you expected to get a bullet mold that matched your gun. Um, so bullets for, for a custom rifle. Uh, being made in a small American shop, it was up to the consumer what the bore size is. You know you would get a matching bullet mold that matched it. Um, so uh, reaming the barrel out. The second shortest job in making a barrel is welding it into a tube, uh, hammering it octagon. Um, this, this barrel's been hammered smooth enough that I don't have to file the bottom of it uh, since the bottom three flats of the barrel are concealed by the wooden gun stock. Uh, those are workshop choices they would have described as being workmanlike. So if there's a way to cut corners and save time and money, it's on things that don't show. Uh, and American rifles show obvious evidence of haste. Uh, they're worried about speed. Again, materials cost more than labor. When I made this barrel, the bar I started with weighed 14 pounds. Now it weighs seven and a half. Well, that's how much of it flaked off in oxidation and went liquid in the form of the faint bursting sparks that indicate you're at welding temperature. 
So a gun barrel, first thing we make in the barrel is the hole. Uh, we have the, some of the pictures of being welded um, available. And uh, welding the tube is one of my favorite parts of making making guns in here. It's a, it's a dramatic sort of thing to be able to see because there's sparks and flux flying all over the place, but it's got to be a seamless tube. Um, and the definition of that type of weld is that it's fused and become one piece. Now, the next, uh, we have a video of uh, a barrel being reamed out. The bit is following a hole, making the hole larger and smoother. And I've never reamed a barrel. We didn't use a dozen or more bits. So uh, for us in this situation is the better part of three or four days. One man is uh, cranking the flywheel to make the bit spin. The barrel's mounted on a sliding carriage and we push the barrel onto the bit. And the only place that bit can go is the path of least resistance, the hole that's in the barrel. But each one of those bits from bit to bit is making the hole larger and smoother. And then if it's gonna be a rifle barrel, then the additional step is to cut spiral grooves in it. And uh, I think we have a video of that. So, uh, and that's a matter of walking backwards and counting to seven. So the easiest part of making a barrel is the last several barrels we've rifled in here. It, it took four hours and the, the, you always anticipated the possibility of deepening those grooves, freshening a barrel is a common repair. Um, the barrel can have its original accuracy restored by cutting the grooves deeper and you don't have to put it back on the machine to do that. It can be freshened uh, with a, a lead slug onto an iron rod and that's a, a common repair. So you might have an original barrel that was in a couple of different stocks, the barrel could still be used over and over again. And that's making the barrel for us is the most labor intensive part of making uh, the firearm. But um, welding the tube is the second shortest job. Reaming the whole smooth is the longest single operation. Holly has a question that I'm sure you get all the time, which is a modern question. Do you make guns today for purchase? In addition to answering that, tell us about the buying experience in the 18th century. Who, who's coming in? Is it, are, are there pre-made things that people can get, or are they mostly custom ordering? At, at a merchant store is where you would have a variety available for sale, and you bought those over the counter. Um, but it's along the Great Wagon Road that becomes the greatest area of rifle production. Um, Winchester, Virginia has a courthouse by 1742. Well, if you've got a courthouse, you're not frontier anymore. Um, the closest towns of the frontier that can support tradesmen are on that road, the, the Great Wagon Road. Um, so rifles are made all along that road. The road ran from Philadelphia to the Yadkin River Valley in 1750. Um, according to a map we quote, uh, Thomas Jefferson's father was one of the cartographers. He said the road was 435 miles long. Well, deer hunters in 1750 would have to bring their deer skins to a town on the Great Wagon Road to sell them, and that's where you got rifles made. Now, the appeal, um, that customer in the backwoods and the frontier is not only paying higher American labor rates, but higher materials cost for a rifle. So then the appeal is that you get exactly what you want, and... Uh, and that included bore size and weight and how thick the barrel is and what the gun weighs determine how long it's gonna last. Um, so in, in theory, it could have been a one-time purchase and then uh, critical distances, type of wood, what it's mounted in, what it's stocked in, all that's up to you. I didn't mention the third American characteristic for a long rifle is that curly maple wood is used for the stock wood. Uh, so getting back to that question, uh, we, offer our customers today all the options you could have had then. So barrel length, bore size, critical distances, and, and, and every state has a hunting season for this type of firearm. So uh, it's a popular hobby for a lot of people. And um, we, we're doing it here to preserve the trade in its entirety. And, and uh, lots of people that are interested in our work uh, are interested in that it's made with this technology. Todd was curious uh, to know if people made their own guns in the 18th century. It's a, there, there may be things that you 
could do yourself, but it's a, it's a professional trade taught through an apprenticeship. Um, it's, it's complicated to make a gun in its entirety using this technology. Um, so even if you had smithing skills on a farm, welding a barrel requires specialized equipment. So, uh, and there are blacksmiths who can repair black metal parts of a gun. Um, the only people sort of trained to do it all here are, are somebody who has the title of gunsmith. Gunsmith is product specific as opposed to material specific. So we have to be able to work all these different raw materials and that's a pretty broad scope of skills you have to have to be able to, to do that. And you may be able to restock a gun. Uh, common repair is putting old metal parts on a new gun stock and that's something that uh, could be done with uh, uh, woodworking skills and, and ability to use those different tools, but it will show that it wasn't made by a professional. So a lot of specialized skills and tools. Uh, CQ was curious about the tools. Do you use old tools or new tools? Where do you get your tools then well, now? Some are a, a combination of things. Some, some specialized tools like the, the reaming bench, all the boring bits, uh, the rifling machine were tools that even an 18th century American gunsmith would have to make um, because they're so specialized. Uh, unless merchants can make money selling a tool for which there's high predictable and consistent demand, there's no incentive to. Uh, we, the, virtually the only old tools we use in here are the vices. Uh, they're old. We have a, a, a tool shop that made period correct types of tools for use in the trade shops. Um, and some we make ourselves, uh, even uh, some small specialized types of chisels or uh, tools used for putting uh, silver wire inlay in the stock, we make ourselves. So. It's a combination of things, some, uh, but most are new tools that uh, haven't changed in thousands of years in, in their style or function. Our most used tool after a hammer is uh, our files. You know, so every part of a gun's filed at some point, and our files are new files. So David is, is wondering about um, who you were making guns for in terms of were you making them for civilians or yeah. for military? Well, there's no military arms production at all in America before the revolution started. Uh, that's how scarce skilled labor is here. So it's not practical to try to make hundreds of thousands of military arms, you know, with, one, with, with small American shops. And the shortage of skilled labor here is why uh, most things <laughs> weren't made here. Um, the only type of firearm that's made here in any significant quantity is a rifle, and that's because of the small, inconsistent backwoods demand. Uh, muskets are imported and go into military storehouses in town. Uh, fouling pieces are available over the counter to merchant store. So uh, like any tour utensil, it's cheaper to buy the imported tool than to make it here. and and it might be leading into another question, but a gun made in England is the work of dozens of people practicing dozens of specialties. Uh, so there's a, there's a 1747 document that calls the gun maker in England the guy who screws it together requiring no particular skill to do that. Well, that gun maker in England is a contractor. So he has a contract with workshops to supply him with parts. And, and then does the final assembly. Well, that's fully evolved industrial economy. That's why an imported gun, including paying 40 or 50 guys who made it, markup at the store middlemen and shipping cost is a fraction of the price of a gun made here. So earlier when you were talking about uh, the English surprise maybe that American guns were, were so good, why was that? Is that well, partially because of that, that manufacturing differences? No, or? it's the culture in the backwoods that knows how to use it. Uh, you know, the, the approve, the, <clears throat> there's a Virginia company raised their rendezvous point with Shepherdstown, Virginia. They had so many men show up to fill. What Congress authorized was payment for 68 privates. So yeah, hundreds of men show up. 
a Scottish immigrant saw it, wrote it in his diary because they decided to have a shooting match. And the target was described as being a one foot by one foot board with a moderate nose drawn in chalk that who came nice, the nose would go. And the first 40 or 50 guys who shot at the board had blown the nose all out of the board. By the time everybody fired, the board shared the same fate. So it's a rifle using culture in the backwoods and frontier, pre-agricultural frontier economy, you make cash money selling deer skins. And it's dollar and buck become synonymous because of the deer skin trade. We've already alluded to the Indian trade where the, the value of consumer goods is expressed in pounds of dressed deer skin, but a rifle is the most efficient way to get deer skins. The most efficient use of powder and lead, precise shot placement, and a deer skin you can sell for a relatively small investment in powder and lead. So it's the culture. The, the backwoods consumer is responsible for the evolution of long rifle. It's, it's easier to load when it's long. You need two hands to load it. The evolution of a hinge metal lid in the door of the box, you know, are all characteristics that make this more practical for frontier use. So there's, there's your rifle using culture, uh, are people from the backwoods and frontier where rifles are part of their culture. And they're described by, by English officers as being the best marksmen in the world. Steve had a question, kind of picking up a little bit on Europe and America. Were locks ever imported? Yes. Or, or? Yeah. It, 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 in fact, you're most likely to see, or more likely to see, an imported lock on an American rifle than, than a locally made one. Yet, in spite of that, there are occasions we see locally made locks on original rifles. Um, there's a gunsmith in Rockbridge County in 17... Uh, 94 when he died he had 29 pounds weight of lock making tools so to not make money while you're making that specialized tooling uh, may indicate uh, a problem of availability you can't get them when you need them and the forging dies are, are producing essentially a standardized part that will vary from hand filing um, James Getty uh, in 1744, when he died, his estate inventory said he had 30 gun locks, 12 pistol sized. So there's a difference in size. So the 18 were for a long gun, uh, the 12 were for pistols. And uh, Getty had done a repair for a man who never came back to get his gun and uh, thinks he died. And he runs, runs an ad in the paper and, uh, and says, uh, if you have claim to the gun, pay me the charges. He described the repair as new stocked and new locked. So you have, you have enough wear and tear to break a gun stock rather than make six new parts to make, make an old lock new again, you just replace it with the cheap imported lock. And the uh, locks in the 18th century are designated by how many bridles they have. So unbridled is the cheapest. A single bridle has an internal bridle and a double bridle is the most expensive. So if you can anticipate your demand for the coming year or years, you can have them on hand ready to use. But you have to be able to make a lock to fix one. So a gunsmith here could make a lock, but can't do it for the same price as an imported one. Angie asks about um, if there's any identifying information on the gun as to the owner or the maker. Occasionally, um, there there are uh, places in the Valley of Virginia where the owner's initials are on the are, are on the box lid. So sometimes you see initials, sometimes you see names on side plates. Um, there's an ad uh, in the Virginia Gazette uh, where a man marching from Augusta County to Williamsburg has his rifle stolen at New Kent Courthouse and he describes it in the paper in detail. And uh, it, it, it's it's a great ad that says what the type of wood was. It said the stock was sugar tree curled, made pretty dark by aqua fortis. Uh, it said it had a brass box, flourished at the breach, and it said it had a signature. It said it was signed J. Gratton below the hindsight. So there's the hindsight, below the hindsight is in this section. So that, there's one that's recognizable, identifiable, and he offered a reward for it. Other ones, uh, are 
unique in, in that uh, the type of wood that they're made of or other characteristics that we know of an iron mounted uh, rifle that is stolen. They run an ad in the Virginia Gazette again. They said the stock was persimmon tree, um, very uh, small bore, pistol lock, and the box lid is lost. Well, it's probably a sliding wood box since the box lid on a sliding wood bo box comes all the way out, it could be lost. So the fact that that had a persimmon stock and the box lids lost and had a very small bore and a pistol lock uh, would make it identifiable. The reward was $2 and no questions asked. Drop it off the newspaper office. Christian wants to know about pistols. In particular, okay. how common were they and um, how were they carried? And uh, well, in, in holsters or a case, because uh, they're typically sold in pairs. If you're traveling, they're in pistol buckets in front of the neck of the horse within easy reach. Um, this large uh, spur pommel is the, the style you most closely associate with uh, horse pistols. So it's a large pommel, that easy to grab. Um, uh, I think it's an unusual gentleman who wouldn't have a pair of pistols because they're needed for traveling. We talk about the transient population coming in and out of town because the government is here. Uh, you don't travel without being armed. Now, farmers don't need them. Uh, deer hunters don't need them. So they're relegated to that sort of uh, social class. Howard uh, was curious about bore sizes. Were there standard ones, or how, how are those things designated? Only, only military guns have a standard bore size so that ammunition could be mass produced and passed out. Um, so having mass produced interchangeable ammunition uh, for, for a musket you know, makes it fast to load, makes supply easier. Um, Civilians having a custom rifle made would choose the bore size based on how many round balls you get from a pound of lead. Well, that's what gauge means today. 20 gauge means you get 20 round balls from one pound of lead. Uh, so it doesn't have anything to do with shot pellets. It's the weight of the ball that fits that hole. So a bullet for a 20 gauge weighs 1 20th of a pound. Uh, you know, we have rifles in here that shoot a ball as small as 38 to the pound. Well. It takes the same quantity of powder and lead to shoot 20 shots as it does 38. So for uh, a market hunter, that cost per shot figures into profit margin. Shooting real heavy bullets uh, requires more gunpowder to push them. Uh, shooting lighter bullets with less powder um, could make the rifle more efficiently using powder and lead. Uh, but no matter what the bore size is, you always bought twice as much lead as gunpowder. Uh, we've got uh, three lead bricks over on the keg in the bay window. Well, those three bricks weigh 50 pounds. For 50 pounds of lead, you need a keg of 25 pounds of powder. Those are the proportions. And for one of the rifles in here, that's 1,900 shots. So. Barry asks if... Um, paper cartridges were available to civilians or if, if civilians would have to buy powder and balls yeah, you buy, Well, you don't buy the bullets, you buy one pound bars of lead and for every one pound bar of lead you bought, you bought half a pound of powder. You make your own bullets as a convenience. Um, it's a fast way to load a musket, but it's not a consistent way to load a rifle. So carefully measuring the powder charge and you know the powder charge is approximately half the ball weight. Uh, the maximum, it never goes above half the ball weight. So your know, rifle shoots 180 grain bullet, the maximum powder charge is 90 grains of powder. But to get the best accuracy, you have to be familiar with your rifle. Changing anything uh, is an inconsistent way to load a rifle and, and could potentially have a negative impact on accuracy. Uh, so the name of the game with the rifle is, is, uh, is doing everything the same from shot to shot. We do see references of frontier cabins being attacked by Indians and then those you know, letters or diaries as the case may be, they said we uh, spit down a naked ball, load a bullet without the patch wrapped around it in an effort to load faster. So that's, a, that's in a way to load a rifle faster is to sacrifice accuracy and that's, 
That's basically the idea behind a musket, sacrificing accuracy to gain speed. But you wouldn't buy cartridges, and, and, and stores in town won't stock all those possible bullet sizes because they come into many different bore sizes. Now, shot pellets come in a dozen different finish sizes, but the lead comes in ingots. So you make your own bullets. But one question of, of if you had seen any documentation of any uh, women gunsmiths. I, I know they're working in a trade in England, you know, as part of that, that cheap specialized labor. Anne Getty is master of the shop after James dies in 1744. She becomes the owner of the business, which is master of the shop. So there is that documentation, and that documentation is from here in town. Now, whether she's, you know, she's not doing the work out in the shop, there's no doubt in my mind that that is not the case. Her husband was a gunsmith. Uh, she, she becomes the owner of the business. Um, so I, there's not a lot of, a lot of documentation. You, you know, if, if you need that additional labor in your shop, you know, uh, that be, may be an indicator as uh, that you're maybe not doing that well economically, but uh, very little documentation, but there's no reason. But working in those sub-trades and those specialized trades in England, you know, it, it's more likely to, to be the case where you actually learn to do it all. I have no documentation for that. Time for one last question. And we often like to end by asking our, our tradespeople um, if they have particular projects they've made over the years of which they're most proud or, or were very satisfying or interesting. Now, what, what's, uh, what's satisfying to me is having a satisfied customer. That's first and foremost. And, uh, you know, there's, uh, as far as a type of firearm that I most enjoy making, it's rifles because those are the ones that were likely to be made here. Uh, and the fact that, you know, we get to do it all in, in uh, shaping the stocks a lot of fun. And uh, that stock I'm working on in my bench and device was square the other day, so it's starting to come to, to life now as, uh, as I'm uh, removing wood and, and being able to make a, a, a firearm that someone is going to uh, you know, treasure for the rest of their lives and for generations after that is pretty rewarding as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, Richard, for inviting us all into your shop and sharing your skills and knowledge with us. Thanks everybody at home for your great comments and questions. Of course, all of our programs are made possible by the generosity of our donors. To learn how you can support presentations like this, follow the link pinned to the comments below or visit us at colonialwilliamsburg.org. Richard, do you have any final thoughts to send uh, people uh, along? Thank you for your time and I uh, hope you enjoyed it and hope to see you soon. Take care. <laughs>